Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming uh, to this panel. Just so you know, um, if you would like to see the slides that I have located um, on the screen, you can double click on them, and that will actually make them full screen. Um, I want to thank everyone so much for coming to what I think is a very timely roundtable. Um, all four of us are very excited to speak to you. Uh, my name is Maxwell Foxman, and I'm the chair of the Higher Education Video Game Association's task force on COVID-19. And I'm joined with um, with uh, Andy Phelps, uh, uh, which which includes Andy Phelps and Kelly Dunlop. They're both on the task force. Andy is also the president of HEVCA. Kelly has been a longtime member. And Tracy Fullerton, our third panelist, is a former board member and fellow. Um, for those who need an introduction, HEVGA is an academic professional association for faculty, students, and affiliates who work in games and, uh, uh, and uh, high, uh, who work in games in higher education. Um, and we were asked by Games for Change to put together this roundtable because of the work that the task force is doing uh, surrounding COVID-19. Um, I'm also a professor of media studies and game studies at the University of Oregon. And my research focuses on the influence of games and the game industry in non-game contexts, ranging from uh, virtual and augmented reality to game journalism. And I'm actually currently uh, in the process of finishing a co-authored book on the latter subject. Um, I should also add that as a lifelong New Yorker before I moved to Oregon two years ago, I'm particularly pleased to be speaking at Games for Change. And as someone who lived in Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's uh, district and studies game journalism, I was surprised when all of these worlds collided. Um, a few months ago, my social media feed blew up when articles started to come out about the form my former representative traveling to Players Islands and Animal Crossing at the peak of the pandemic in New York. And I, it was an odd mixture of things. Um, first, uh, elected officials like Ocasio-Cortez were turning to games to connect with constituents during the crisis. Second, it reminded me of how popular the game had become in just a few months. And third, this sort of coverage I knew from my own scholarship was pretty rare. I can't remember the last time I read about a politician's semi-casual gameplay. Um, each of these facts struck me as a big deal, particularly because video games were being taken seriously as an important means of connection, entertainment, and education all at once. And it's these issues which will preoccupy our conversation. Uh, to, take, to briefly take you through uh, what the hour is going to look like, I'll first describe uh, the shifts in gaming because of COVID-19 that are preoccupying the task force. I'll then share some of our earliest findings about how public perception has changed about games during this time period. But this is going to be very short, only a couple minutes, and will simply be an introduction to our roundtable conversation with an esteemed group of mental health experts, game designers, and professors who are here to discuss and answer larger questions about how the virus is impacting educators and industry alike. Um, I'll begin that discussion and then open up questions to, for you to post uh, in the chat. So please feel free even now to uh, start typing those questions in there. So let's start by quickly reviewing what the COVID-19 task force is. Uh, the team was formed this past March to tackle what were seen as pressing issues that might arise for educators primarily those teaching how to make games, but also taking into consideration broader considerations uh, like student mental health and uh, their career trajectories. We identified uh, four areas that uh, we will address throughout the year to briefly explain each. We are first looking at educational needs and concerns of faculty, students, and administration in terms of how the virus impacts everything from coursework to access to hardware or even play testers and of course, uh, student career prospects. Um, we're also identifying new challenges and opportunities that might arise as studios and developers become more socially and physically distant. Um, how are things like crime, the difficulties of working from home, for instance? At the same time, there are plenty of opportunities for game makers um, as social interactions are occurring more online than ever before. Sites like Hopin or Zoom or Virtual Spaces, which ga the game industry has been dealing with for many more years than those startups. And thus our third area is to focus on how we can promote ideas and actual games to the broader public. And finally, we are addressing uh, how coverage and attitudes of games are changing during the crisis because we may be entering uncharted territory when it comes to a more general endorsement of social and mental health benefits of gameplay. 
On that note, and uh, since it is tied to my own research, I'll next briefly share some very, very preliminary findings I and the ta and task force member Robin Fitzclement are beginning to uncover after collecting close to 200 mainstream news articles from the start of the pandemic to today. At this stage, we've identified five intersecting themes which emerged in the first months of the crisis and which I see as a roadmap by which we can start a broader conversation about the pandemic and higher education. Um, the first of these, and a highly unusual one at that, is presenting games as a potential stand-in for real-world activities. There were plenty sto of stories of people getting married, going to church, or even potentially holding entertainment and political events that normally take place in the real world. Um, one of the more circulated stories involved the Biden campaign, potentially holding a rally in Fortnite after the successful Travis Scott concert. Um, for me, this speaks to the ongoing potential for games and virtual spaces to facilitate more meaningful ways of getting together as we all interact more online because of quarantines. Similarly, games were portrayed as a way of dealing with a world turned upside down by social, mental, mental and physical upheaval. Uh, in particular, Animal Crossing with its real world tasks of gardening and interior design was lauded for being the game for the coronavirus moment. More generally, this frame shows an acceptance of the useful um, uh, of games being useful over old tropes of violence or addiction, which tend to dog popular coverage. On that same note, there were quite a few articles about how games were simply good for you, whether it was for connecting grade school children to friends, dealing with physical isolation, or even an easy means for intergenerational bonding. Um, they were portrayed as a net positive for society. And expectations for gamer, game makers, however, were high. In particular, a few articles suggested they could take the lead in building a more robust social virtual environment. What's interesting for me is how optimistic this view still was when issues, for instance, of trolling were a common point of concern only months earlier. And these net positives were also tied to net profits, even a potential bubble in the industry um, th uh, that the industry was experiencing during the pandemic. Uh, so in sum, we see the pub that public perceptions of games are rapidly changing. Things which many in this uh, virtual room take as a given, from the profitability of the industry to pro-social good of gameplay, were all attested to. Additionally, I continue to be awestruck by the scope and scale by which games were promoted to be part of everyday and mundane activities. This suggests that with proper support and attention, the belief that they can spur social and cultural change is only strengthening in the public eye. However, I emphasize that such an optimistic view is counterbalanced by challenges to the education industry and public understanding of games, all subjects I plan to discuss with our roundtable. So I want to introduce and thank our panelists for being here. Uh, Kelly Dunlap is a psychologist and professor at American University. As a member of the COVID-19 task force, we are particularly grateful for her expertise in how game design and play can affect mental health. Uh, Tracy Fullerton is an award-winning game designer who provides professional, educational, and administrative experience as the Director Emeritus of the USC Games Program. Andy Phelps, HEVGIS President, currently is affiliated with two labs in the USA and New Zealand and has successfully developed a number of award-winning games. Recently, in line with, what the task force, uh, with the task force goals, he penned an opinion piece about what games could teach us all during the pandemic. Uh, thank you all very much. And, to ki uh, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll kick off the, qu uh, the conversation with a few questions for our panelists. But as I said, please feel free to write your questions in the chat and I'll work them into the conversation. So I'm going to close this panel and start chatting with all of you. Um, so uh, to begin with, um, for the roundtable in general, each of you are in higher education in one way or another. And I was interested in your stories of how the coronavirus uh, impacted your teaching personally. You want to call on one of us or shall we just... <laughs> <laughs> Just jump in. Sure, I'm, I'm more than happy to do so, um, though feel free to jump in whenever you like. Um, I, uh, maybe I'll, I'll start with Kelly a little bit because I know that we were even speaking before the panel started about how you had moved some of your, um, your coursework onto Mixer, which I thought was pretty innovative, but you don't have to start there, you can, you can keep going. Uh, I mean, you know, American University where I teach is a, you know, it's a, it's a big school and it has a really large international population. And even just domestically, there's a lot of kids from all over the U.S. So when this was starting to happen, there was definitely a concern of like, OK, well, what's, you know, what's going to happen? And then it was kind of like flipping a switch of, well, we're online now, so have fun. Um, thankfully, 
I feel pretty fluent in, you know, gamer spaces and things like Mixer and Twitch and ways of communicating online, Discord, all that kind of stuff. So for me, it was actually pretty easy in order to like just move it online. Um, I felt good about that in terms of my students were safer. They weren't having to come to campus. They weren't having to take public transit. Like it was, it was the right thing to do. Um, what I did discover though, is that what I have planned is a two and a half hour lecture, you know, with breaks and activities and interactions does not translate one-to-one -one on a, uh, a mixer stream. So that was a learning and something that I'm adapting to on the fly and figuring out, you know, people might sit and watch someone play Fortnite for three hours, but they're not going to sit and listen to someone talk about, you know, I was teaching the psychology of video games. So they're not going to sit and listen about, you know, depression representation in environment design for two and a half hours, even though I certainly would. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been having to change on the fly, which is something I think gamers tend to be pretty good at anyway. Um, but then also taking those learnings and applying them going forward so that, you know, I don't make the same very understandable mistakes that happened last time. And just being able to quickly adapt to things has been probably easier for me than I would probably say for you guys, because this is my third semester teaching. So it's not like I have lesson plans or stuff that are entrenched, you know, it feels like all of it's on the fly. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what my experience has been like. Um, Tracy, I'm wondering if any of your insights from the administrative level, I know that you're no longer the director of USC Games, but did you notice or did you do you have any insights as to how this worked on a programmatic level? Sure, absolutely. Um, so uh, first of all, I was extremely happy um, not to be the um, director of the program at this particular moment. Um, but I think it gives me actually a great, uh, having been the director for so long and then, you know, working with Danny Bilson, who's the current director um, and who's a fabulous, um, uh, just a fabulous director for us at this moment, for sure. Um, one of the things I really appreciated was um, Danny could see this coming and um, he gave us forewarning to start checking our technology. Um, you know, we knew I think far enough ahead before the, f the switch was, was flipped that this probably was happening. And then when it happened, um, you know, Danny just said, we're doing it now. We're doing, we're doing it. As he, he said, we're doing it early. We're doing it before they call the actual, you know, here's, we're doing it right. Because his, his underlying, um, you know, objective was always safety first. And I think having someone who just stood that line and said safety first um, made every all the other anxieties and, you know, just stuff that was happening in our lives as educators and just as people, right, um, feel more secure. There wasn't any back and forth. Maybe we're going online. Maybe we're not. Going. Danny's like, we're going safety first everything we do here is going to be about safety first and about you know keeping our community safe right so so the first thing we did was set up a discord um uh for the office it was literally like the front desk and um you could walk in and there were offices and then you know the faculty could talk the students could talk everyone would talk to each other. it was basically like taking our whole community and putting it online so and because everyone's so tech savvy in a games program, it really it was it was actually weird. We were talking more than 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 actually you would bump into people in the hallways, right? So while we're all putting our lectures online, it might seem like we're more isolated. In a way, I felt like the community bonded and came together more than um, we did normally under this this moment of of crisis, right? Um, and just you know personally because I had this inkling that this was going to happen, um, I was able to do a lot of the stuff that required in person earlier in the semester. And I sort of front loaded that. And, and so uh, also a lot of my classes are not lectures. So as Kelly's pointing out, it's really hard to sit for three hours in a lecture, but we would break it up and do exercises and discussions and, you know, breakout rooms and, um, you know, we had a lot of interaction in the classes and weirdly 
I mean, I don't know if anyone else experienced this. I got the highest marks in my evaluation of my, <laughs> that, you know, post that COVID that I'd ever gotten. Um, and I, you know, maybe it was because we had so much one-on-one -on -one Zooming, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations and because we'd worked so hard right at the outset to build an online community for our community, right? Yeah. Hmm. No, I, I think that's really interesting, particularly, uh, we, 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 we suspended our evaluations for the term. So I have Whoa. no idea how my course went um, because it was, it was considered such a, uh, a strange time. Um, I want to return to something that, that you said, but I also, I, I, want to, I want to ask Andy the same thing, how he's been affected, because it sounds like you are, uh, you are away from home, so to speak, <laughs> um, which is yeah. an interesting way to be affected. Uh, yeah. but, but is there anything else that you want to add beyond uh, being quarantined yeah. in New Zealand? Yeah, I mean, also having, having um, run some programs and stuff and, uh, and, and, and running the program at AU, um, I think one of the things that games programs are, are uh, weirdly reaping some benefit from, and it's usually not seen as a benefit, is that we've always been kind of the weird program that nobody else kind of understands, um, particularly in administrative circles. So, you know, folks are like, I don't really know what games do, and I don't know how you teach them, but just kind of stay in your corner. And, um, and it's actually kind of been in our favor with what's happening here because you're like, we're going to go out and use Twitch and Mixer and Discord and this and that. And every other program is like, you know, well, your institution has Blackboard, so you will use Blackboard. And we get to stand there and say, you know, we can't use Blackboard because have you seen games on Blackboard? No, you haven't. And there's a reason for that, right? And so, um, although we did do a Zoom game jam that was actually really cool where people tried to gamify the the idea of Zoom and make it uh, an entertaining experience. Um, so I think that that's, that's gone well. Um, my own work is largely focused on research and advising graduate students right now, which obviously there are some pitfalls there because I have students trapped in a whole bunch of different countries and this, that, and the other. I think the one thing that really hurt that we haven't done as good a job figuring out is that user studies essentially halted, mm. right? Because we're used to bringing people into a lab and looking at everything they do and all this kind of stuff. And so we're figuring out ways to do that remotely, um, but the controls are much more difficult, right? Because when somebody's on the other end and they don't know how to do the thing and whatever, and you're trying to explain it over distance and so on. But, um, you know, there been, that has been one challenge. The, the in, in classroom stuff, I think, has translated more easily than sometimes the out of classroom experimentation stuff. So, so building on that, you know, I, I, I'd be interested in hearing from Kelly and Tracy about other, you know, sort of game, game design specific hurdles that came and, and, and also any ways that you've accounted for it. You know, I was, invited by a friend who was doing play testing on Twitch for a course, I think it was, um, I think it was Queens College or something, you know, it was, it was a place in New York and I got to watch as all the students rolled through their games and got live feedback, which I thought was pretty fun. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, what have been, what are the hurdles that, that I'm missing that, that others might miss and how have you been tackling them? Well, I can jump in and say, um, yeah. first of all, Andy's completely right that user testing is important at every level of game design. And so that's one of the main things we wanted to, you know, hit hard and fast. Um, and so, you know, we've been using tools that range everything from tabletop simulator to um, uh, just setting up user tests using Discord um, so that we continue to get user feedback at, at every level of instruction um, and research. But the, the, I think the most important thing um, that was a huge hurdle for us was the end of year show is something that most game programs have. And we take very seriously as the sort of, um, you know, professionalization uh, opportunity and opportunity for, for these big games that students have been working so hard on their capstone projects or, um, or otherwise, um, to get in front of real public eyes and get played, right? And we just had to turn on a dime 
uh, when that flip, flip that switch was flipped and say, how are we going to provide this opportunity for our students in as meaningful a way as possible within the next, you know, like six or seven weeks, right? It was like <laughs> seven weeks from the yeah. switch to our expo which went completely online, right? And so, you know, we had to figure out how to do it, how to get eyes on it, and also how to get the games meaningfully played. So it meant that every single project had to have a downloadable, playable version for the website, and that uh, featured projects um, had to be demoable, and also we engaged streamers to play the, um, uh, a subset of the games um, live, right? So that they got meaningful play testing right there. Um, some of the, the groups did their own, once the game would be showed in the stream, there's a nine hour stream that we did. Um, and, um, we got, um, uh, 80,000 unique viewers. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, we had, we bought an, everyone we could think of, uh, Mark Hamill, um, uh, Jeff Kaplan, um, I just like kind of all like all these people um, came in and um, hosted or or otherwise gave shout outs to the games and and so that was something that took the entire faculty usually it's a subset of the faculty the entire faculty just threw in hours and hours and hours of their own free COVID time um, to turn this thing on a dime and 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 bring it online and the learning that we found was that is that we will probably never do an exclusively in-person event. It, we are going to always have a hybrid now because the, the reach of the event was unprecedented. Um, and so, yeah, we, that, our learning is, wow, um, we must have a hybrid event from now on. We want to come back in person. Absolutely. It's so meaningful to see everybody. And, you know, you know many of our alumni come and it's a really meaningful event. But... A uh, hybrid is important. And the other thing about it, by the way, I don't know if anyone else did this, was I was able to go visit other schools' events. Which I'm never <laughs> able to do because they're <laughs> everywhere in the world, right? But then I got to go and, and see all the other schools' events, and it was so cool. So anyways, that was a great opportunity, even though it was a huge hurdle for us. That's yeah, I was, I was just going to make that point, which is, um, from a learning perspective, it was actually really cool this spring because it was one of the first times that I could like take my grad students and show them this is what's happening at USC. This is what's happening at UCSC. This is what happened in Gotland. This is what happened <laughs> in New Zealand. Right. And so, you know, you like, I mean, that's huge. Right. And then we would sit there and post play and then post mortem some of the games. Right. And talk about like, you know, this is how this school is thinking about it. And this is so there's there's an opportunity there to not walk that back when things go back to normal, right? There's an opportunity there to keep that, which I think is, uh, is really interesting. Well, I really don't want to follow that. <laughs> I, can't, <laughs> I don't think I can't you have to. Mark Hamill, like I can't, um, and so, you know, I'm, I am a, you know, I'm an adjunct. I'm the juniorist junior faculty member. Um, I have one course and I was teaching the psychology of video games. And so it is inherently much more of a, a lecture-based course and not really a game building course, although I did have them make a game about mental health at the end. Um, the biggest challenge for me was just, you know, because the psychology of games is inherently experiential, like there are games that teach you like, this is Pavlov, this is Sigmund, like you can do those or you can play a game like Psychonauts or, you know, send them a sacrifice, which I had to take off the syllabus because I realized it would probably be unethical to play with my students um, just because of like the inherent trauma in it. You know, it was, uh, it was fun times. And so like at the game lab, you know, we've got PlayStations, we've got a Commodore 64, we've got, you know, the Xbox, we have everything. And so I was really free to pull from the best examples that I could of, okay, this week we're talking about the representation of depression in games or anxiety in games or PTSD in games. I can pull any game I can think of because I know we have the hardware to play it. And then when we had to isolate, I was like, well, crap, I don't, I have an Xbox and I love my Xbox, but I don't have all the things. Um, and so that was really challenging. And the way I navigated that was one, see if my students had it, because if they did, I'd ask them if they were okay to stream the game. Uh, if not, I would take, I would find YouTube tutorials or like walkthroughs and talk 
as those walkthroughs happened, but I'm usually looking for like such a specific cut of something. I often had to go in and like record it myself and you know, which mm. not a big deal, but it's definitely time I wasn't expecting to have to put in. Um, and so that was a huge challenge. And there is definitely something lost when you're talking about something as like really sensitive as like psychosis in games when you're doing it not face to face with someone. So that has definitely been a challenge. Um, I also found that discussion really petered out in terms of like they showed up, said hello, and then, you know, did really didn't hear much <laughs> every now and then. But that said, like, okay, you know, you're, you're grown ups, do whatever you're gonna do. But what was surprising that bonus that came out of that is because the streams were public, I had randoms coming in <laughs> and like having conversations and asking questions. And so even if they weren't my students, there was still discussion. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of like a public service. I'm showing what it's like to have a game design course, especially on one, like a topic like mental health and the ethics of portraying mental health and, you know, these very small niches where I find myself. Um, so very much like Tracy said, finding a broader audience that was just as excited while still doing my very best to make sure that my students got the best instruction that I could give them with the tools that I had. That's awesome. Well, I, I saw that there was a, uh, a string of uh, questions on the chat a little while ago, which I definitely think is worth bringing up. And I saw that Andy, you uh, partially answered it, but maybe we can go a little bit uh, beyond, is there was an interest uh, primarily from PF echoed by Julie about uh, being curious about building games in higher education, not just in game programs. And for instance, James also made the suggestion of integrating it, uh, using games to integrate students into university life, which is obviously gonna be a big deal this uh, upcoming term with uh, you know campuses being half open or not open or whatever it might be. Um, so I think that that's a really, uh, I, I don't know if anyone wants to pick up. Andy, you had suggested uh, a couple of resources, uh, but. I would be happy to get responses from anyone about that subject, games in other parts of the university, I guess. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, I guess um, I mean, one of the things that's happened with this is that uh, um, working with, so Lindsay always makes this joke and I think it's hilarious, right? That that games are not often well understood by other parts of the university. And so you get people showing up saying, you know, like I'd like a case of games, please. Um, which is a, a great way to sort of frame like people that don't make games don't quite get what's involved in making a game, et cetera. And um, this has made uh, a, I, I'm getting a lot of requests for cases of games at the moment. Um, but I think there's also an opportunity there, right? Because all of a sudden, right, people have gone online and there is this sort of background understanding that like, oh, the the people in the game stuff, like they've been doing this a while. They know how to engage people online in ways that, you know, I think some of my colleagues in other programs were like, had never taught online at all. And were suddenly, you know, thrown, uh, you know, finish your math class on online and make it fun. And, um, and so I think that there's an opportunity there because I've had people reaching out from all kinds of different departments um, saying, hey, can you help us with how to engage our, keep our students engaged online and what does that look like? Um, and some of them are the traditional, you know, like the, the you know, digital humanities narrative folks will reach out and stuff like that. But uh, I had student affairs reach out. I had student advising reach out. Um, and then the one that's interesting right now that is really complex is some of the folks in the hard sciences. Right? Mm -hmm. Because they don't have access to laboratory facilities that they would have had access to. And so they're like, how do we teach somebody to use a really complex thing in a virtual environment, um, you know, well? Uh, and that's really, really interesting as a, as a way that games can continue to expand the service that it provides to the rest of the university. Uh, I think there's a, there's a really golden opportunity here. Um, because I think we do know some things about how people behave online uh, in in groups uh, in way, in ways that could be useful to the broader broader community. Well, and, and I wondered, you know, this is this is just occurring to me is you know, game making is such a craft. But are there any requests for game tools? You know, the idea of going on to something like Twitch 
if you consider Twitch a tool, or using something like Unity. Is, the, is, is there, is, uh, there was a question about, you know, um, barriers of adoption, but I'm wondering if, if that's a push at all, or if, if it really is the kind of like, as, as one person put it, the gallon of games, please. <laughs> um, is there is there a desire like is there any desire to sort of interface with these tools and think okay well maybe I'm not going to make a game because I don't know how to do that but I'm going to make uh, an environment in Mozilla Hubs and I just need to figure out like how to navigate what that looks like or something of that sort or is that is that just me being hopeful? I I would say it's a, it's an entire range. Yeah, okay. you know, I mean I just want to say that. Um, what I'm finding is not people asking for games. What what I'm seeing is that um, game a game program like ours, for example, as I mentioned, we just went. We were like, we're going online. We're safer online. We just use, that's our mantra: safer online. We have not been anticipating going back in person, and so we've been able to spend all of our energy and be very calm. The entire faculty has worked all summer long to make what our resources better for being online. And even when they're going back and forth and back and forth, do we have to have hybrid, you know, blah, 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 blah. We're like better online. And because we've been able to stay that course very steadily from the first moment in March when this started to happen, we have felt a sense of calm. And I think that that leadership has spread to our students. But what I'm not, I'm, I'm not seeing that in departments outside of ours. And so they actually are looking to our leadership now, like Danny's been put on all these, these um, committees about how to go online because we are literally, boom, sailing straight line. And they've been going hybrid, no, imper no, ha oh, on oh, ah, 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 wait. and every four weeks there's a new plan, right? And so the, the faculty are all agitated, the students are agitated, everybody's agitated. Right. Whereas, whereas we had the luxury of saying, hey, making games, by the way, in remote settings is something that's already done. You know, sharing code done. We already we, we were already set up because we already collaborate with other universities. So, yeah, we're going to share code. Yeah, we're going to have team meetings online. Yeah, we're going to work remotely. All these things. We're, now we're just going to find better ways of building teams. We're going to find this is we're using this as an opportunity moment to teach our students about crisis leadership, right? So those people who are chosen as the the leaders of their games, you know, like I just gave a talk the other day because because I've been actually teaching the, my fall students during the summer. That's the other thing we've been able we've started early essentially with them, and I've been teaching them about the responsibilities of leading people in a crisis and making sure they have a safe work environment and is the number one priority. Right. Mm. But what I see on these other departments is not they're not coming looking for games. They're coming looking for calm. Right. <laughs> they want Fair. to be as calm as we are. Yeah. You know? I, I, I'm I wondering. Um, and, and this, again, comes from a, a chat comment, but it was it was something I'd written down. Uh, what about what about issues with access? Because obviously one of the major benefits of a university is potential access to hardware that you might not be able to afford yourself. And I you know also here in Oregon, that is a conversation we have a lot because we have a lot of students. I think a, a large portion of each class is maybe coming to college for the first time, coming from remote areas, etc. So um, I'm wondering I'm wondering how how you're tackling that issue um, on the ground. I mean, Tim Gunn, make it work. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, there, it's at least for me, it's not even a matter of, oh, maybe we can make it work for them. It's not because no one, at least again, for my class, no one can have an Xbox and a PlayStation and a Game Boy and a Commodore and a Wii and a Switch and all the things that our lab has. It's just not like, it's just not gonna happen. So okay, that's off the table. Rather than worry about and fret about, oh, something I can't control. Sorry, this is the therapist coming through. Where instead of worrying about things that I can't control, let me focus on the things that I can. So you know what? If the affordance that I'm gonna use is a Twitch platform, then you bet I'm gonna do in real time. I'm gonna have an active chat. I'm gonna invite streamers I know who are playing games. I'm terrible at Celeste, which is a fantastic platformer that has deeply involved with mental health, but I'm terrible at it. So I'm either gonna put on like God mode and explain about accessibility and why that's important in design and why that's a fundamental issue that we as designers need to be aware of, or I'm gonna 
Pool and a friend who like pro runs it and does speed runs. And then we talk about subversive play and what it means to play in a way that the game maybe didn't necessarily expect you to do. And so it's not a matter of like, again, clutching pearls, or I'm sure some people are, and I'm sure their pearls are lovely, but <laughs> this is literally something where it's not like, oh, we can just patch it together. It's no, you need to find a different way. You need to be flexible and you need to look at what other people are doing. A lot of the ways that people are looking at us, I was looking at my, uh, my streaming friends. I have a colleague who does UX and all of her students had their final UX projects, bam, bam, bam on her Twitch stream. Mm -hmm. It was like five hours of everybody presenting their final product uh, and like talking about it from as if they were pitching it to like an executive or something like that and taking feedback. And so it's, I always hate when people say, oh, well, you know, back in real life or IRL. It's like, no, 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 this is real life. <laughs> it just happens to have a digital interface over the top of it. And so if, you know, if the Xbox broke in the lab, I would use something else. And I feel like this is very much the time for us to be able to have that flexibility. Yeah, yeah. I, I, my, my only thought would be have, have any of the three of you how how the students reacted to that because i could imagine I, i'm not teaching any students like this myself but students might come in wanting to say like my dream was to work in vr you know i wanted to get my hands on that vibe or something along the lines of that now i can't is there advice you have particularly for other educators in this chat about you know how to tackle that particular sort of i mean part of it is it's a pandemic obviously but um but i'm wondering if there's if there's any sort of protocols or ways that that can be dealt with um, meaningfully. Well, we're yeah, checking ours out. Oh, sorry, Andy, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, uh, I'm just saying, <laughs> I mean, basically our labs, the equipment in our labs are being checked out to individual teams, right? So, you know, if, they're, if there's stuff in our labs that can help a team work remotely, um, we, we're just basically we've created a process. There's a request process, and then it will be checked out and respond, the people will be responsible for it. Um, uh, during the semester. So they will be able to work with that equipment. Um, I mean, some of the harder things are maybe research where we have, for example, we're making console games and we don't have enough dev kits to go around, right? Mm. So that's a little more difficult. But things like, you know, um, VR, it, you know, mobile devices, um, we, can, we can get those and we can check them out. Yeah, I, I was going to you know, from my perspective, um, with the work at American, it's really focused on flexibility, right? So like I basically told all the faculty in the lab, like figure out what it is that's gonna work for your specific course, right? And then we'll find a way to make those things happen. Um, so like we've got one course where we're, you know, packaging up and mailing some VR headsets to students in the course so that they, you know, have a VR headset in their, in their house. Um, to use, whereas, you know, but we can't do that for every single student in every single course, et cetera. And so you wind up just, you know, having to, to prioritize, um, you know, different experiences that you want to do. And so I think there's that aspect to it. I think there's also the aspect of, um, like, I know a couple people from the, from the VR lab here are sitting on the very kinds of task forces that, that Tracy was mentioning earlier, right? How do we take you know, some of the hard sciences stuff and simulate it online, how, you know, mm. and this is not a, this is not a one month project. This is, this is going to be years to figure this out, but the university has seen and now recognized that, you know, hybrid is going to stick around. Right. And so how do we, how do we work with that? Right. Um, so I think that there's, you know, again, like I keep trying to pivot how to use some of this as opportunities for, for growth in the future. Uh, and I think that that those are those are good ones, right? This whole collaborating online thing is not going to go away. Uh, it's, it's been it's been bubbling up now. forever, right? It's a yeah, <laughs> that we can teach our students now, right? Yeah. I mean, how how many of us in game development have not at some point worked remotely, right? I mean, ever, I mean, I think most people have worked remotely. I mean, I started my company remotely with three different locations, right? This was before we had Zoom. Right. Um, so, so I think these are core skills we're teaching students right now. You know. Yeah. Just to add to that, in terms of like growth, you know, being able to tell students like, okay, maybe you can't access the VR headset right now. Maybe this isn't how you imagined your senior year playing out or your first year of grad school playing out. But like, 
it's a temporary thing. And I know that's one thing I worked with a lot with my students on is like, hey, it sucks. <laughs> There's a pandemic. Everything is different. Nobody knows what's going on, but it's okay because we're going to take it, you know, we're going to break it down, try not to think about, oh, my entire career is over because I can't have an internship this year. No, every same thing. And there's something very comforting about being in a situation where there's so many people who are going to have that shared experience. And so you're not singled out. You're not alone. It's very clear that you're connected. And so allowing them time to have that frustration and that angst of like, this isn't what I wanted. Okay. Yeah, you're right. I didn't want this either, but what can we do to make it as good as possible? And so if you can't get a VR kit, where's your paper prototype? Show that to me, you know, and if, well, maybe this is a limitation and maybe you can only use your 360 video instead of VR. How does that change the game and how does that change how you interact with it? And so having kind of that cognitive growth, that cognitive flexibility of like, okay, this is really difficult, but I'm going to find a way to manage. And for me, at least, that kind of mindset is super helpful when they go into the actual game dev world itself of like, oh my gosh, something's on fire. What am I gonna do about it? I don't have all the tools or time I need. How can I manage not only the task, but also the emotions that come along with it? So all three of you have anticipated my next three questions. So these are just sort of bits of expansion on, on, on each of them. So I'll start with, um, you know, Tracy, uh, you were talking about how your first company, you know, started off remote. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit uh, from your perspective, and obviously anyone can jump in here uh, as they see fit, but, you know, what, what does the future look like for alumni? So do you see any real changes to the game business world as we've become more socially and uh, physically distant? Well, there's, I mean, there's no question it's going to be harder to network and and find jobs. But I also think that, that the jobs that they find, at least right now, are going to be remote. So a lot of these skills are extraordinarily pertinent to their job search right now. And let's be honest, one of the main things that we can help students with is communication. And remote work requires excellent communication skills. So whatever you learn in your remote work, when things finally go back to hybrid or, or in person, uh, those communication skills that you've developed will be necessary and useful. So, you know, uh, for me, I think what we can really help them with is finding opportunities. Um, you know, how many opportunities are out there right now? That's a question. Of course, we're, you know, we've had a bubble, which is kind of great, but then we've also seen some closures, which is kind of bad, right? So we're, we're in this really mixed period right now. Um, and so I, m from my perspective, um, finding those opportunities, we have a program called First Jobs where we try and match, you know, we just use all the resources that we have amongst the faculty to try and find leads and try and match students to excellent first job opportunities. Um, and that's going to become more and more critical for our graduating students. Well, on, on the note that, that, um, that there are sort of opportunities maybe even even beyond traditional gaming studios i'm i'm wondering you know and this this goes more to um what you were saying andy but um and also the opinion piece you wrote uh, a little while ago if maybe you could expand a bit more on some of the lessons that can be learned from game designers from games in general by the broader public and i think you can that can be tied a little bit to career opportunities for graduates because they might be the leaders in that, in conveying that message, right? Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, most of, um, I used to be at RIT where, where most of our students were aspiring to go, you know, kind of into the traditional games industry and, and work as developers and um, shifting to American, that's really been a, there's really a focus that most of our students are not going to go into the traditional games industry. They, they work in Washington, right? They work at, at NGOs and at, at think tanks and at, in, you know, in policy houses and, and for members of, of government. And um, I think that that is a really interesting opportunity because one of the things that, that this whole mess has sort of broken out is the fact that um, we might be really bad at communicating complex things to the general public in a way that they can digest and understand um, just as a, a statement of, of kind of some things that I see happening. Um, and so there is a lot of um, interest right now from 
from groups that are kind of reframing how what their communication strategies look like and how they're engaging people in their core message. Um, and I think games has a role to play in that, um, you know, in an ever more profound way. Great. And then um, I wanted to, to sort of go back to Kelly's uh, comment about sort of helping her students deal with how it just sort of sucks right now um, and prepping for the, <laughs> the future. Um, and I, you know, one of the things that, that I, I know we've spoken about outside of the round tale, but I'd love to hear more of your thoughts about is sort of the role in, in games and mental health, the role you see games playing in mental health right now. Um, and also how you've been sort of communicating that to your students. Um, you know, especially as people are stuck at home, we've all turned to games maybe more than, than usual. I've put in my Animal Crossing hours. Uh, like everyone else, but you know, you know what I mean. Um, so yeah, can you comment on that a little bit. So that's that's a big that's like a whole conference in <laughs> games and mental health. We've but got the, fourteen minutes now. Okay, just... let's break it down. Now. Um, <laughs> in terms of being there for my students, a lot of it's just like, hey, you know what? I'm here, and if you need to talk, let me know. And if you don't feel comfortable with something, especially when we're doing things like, hey, let's talk about psychosis in games, you know, it's really important that there be a level of trust there and that someone can tell me like, hey, this is too much for me. I actually had like my students know when we're playing a game in class, if it's too much, please leave, like get up, leave, put headphones in, do whatever you got to do. And I've had students walk out and like that was too much. I'm like, cool. Lesson learned. Thank you. But I'm glad you left. So that is just giving people those skills it's okay to say, this is not for me. This is too much for me. I'm overwhelmed. Much rather have a student get up and walk out than sit there and like have a panic attack um, by themselves. I found that super helpful with several of the students that I work with, um, especially ones who are like, hey, I've got a medical issue and I can't get into campus. Can I just remote in? Absolutely. So letting them know that they can express their needs and I'm not instantly going to tell them, no, I am Professor Dr. Dunlap and you will show up and sit your butt in my seat and listen attentively. Like that's no, 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 that's not how it's going to work. Um, you need to try and level that power dynamic so they actually feel like they can tell you things. And that has helped so, so much with my students and their stress level. In terms of the wider conversation around mental health and games, it's really, really tricky. Um, on one hand, I know the FDA just approved a game for ADHD. The uh, psychology field is unimpressed, I guess is the <laughs> best way to say it. Um, and that's, again, that's a whole other thing, but it's interesting that it's even possible um, or something that is considered. There are, you know, all these think pieces are just overwhelming with positivity. I mean, you know, in November 2019, the World Health Organization was like, hey, gaming disorder, we're making it a thing. And then March 29 or 2020 is, hey, by the way, did you know that video games can help prevent suicide? So it's this really weird um, thing, at least in the psychology of space, of trying to figure out like what is going on. And I think hopefully the mental health field is finally moving to the point where I think a lot of us have already known like games aren't inherently evil. And they can be used for positive purposes, which I think in this crowd is a no brainer. But trust me, outside of our bubble, it's not. Uh, earlier in the conversation, you know, collaborating with different schools in my psychology of video games course, I had three students who wanted to take it, but they were from the psychology department. All of them were rejected by their advisors because the final was not a paper. What? It was to make a game about <laughs> mental health. <laughs> yeah, I, I kid, I kid you not. Wow. I was so mad. Um, I had to do a lot of processing. <laughs> that. that is so reflective, so reflective of where academic psychology is right now. It's still games are childish, games are bad, games cause violence. Like we're seeing a shift, but it's so glacial and it's so slow. Yeah. And that's just games that, in general, much less games that deal with mental health topics or try to impart any kind of coping skills. It's just, it's wildly different um, between these two areas that I happen to co-inhabit. And it's, it hurts my brain um, sometimes. Yeah, um, I, would, I would also chime in on that. that oh, sorry. Uh, I would also chime in on that, that the, the, the way that we see games in the U.S. is not the way that games are seen worldwide. And so... Um, like being in New Zealand, I think the attitudes about what games were good for socially and educationally when I first arrived was pretty, 
um, pretty rooted in the past. Um, you know, like they were just kind of a time waster and yeah, whatever. And I think that you really saw a shift here um, during lockdown because lockdown was way different here than it was in the States, right? Mm -hmm. It was literally, you go nowhere except the grocery store. And you order food online and you don't this and you don't that and whatever. And you saw a lot of pieces here saying, you know, should I be concerned that my, you know, my kids are all of a sudden playing hours upon hours upon hours of Minecraft or whatever. And you're like, no, because they're hanging out with other kids. That's the whole point. And, you know, so there, there, there was really here in ways that I think in, in the, in the States, we still have some of those conversations, but not in, to the same degree. Um, so keeping a view of how games are perceived worldwide in that, in that construct, I think is um, really valuable. Yeah, I mean, as someone who, who's done a lot of work in game journalism, I think it's really interesting to see how that shift is manifesting on, you know, it, that, that mainstream journalists have really moved in that direction much more rapidly, in part because it's a really good story during pandemic, and then to sort of see how it's sustained and what where it's sustained will be a really interesting question moving ahead. Um, there was a question by Celia earlier, which um, at least two of the people in the round table, myself included, said was a, a good question to ask. So I'm going to go ahead and ask it, which is, um, you know, uh, she was interested in hearing how the Black Lives Matter movement has intersected with COVID and how you've dealt with it in interacting with your students. So particularly as game educators, how have you been um, tackling that issue? Um, and Tracy, since you, uh, you, you thumbs up it, uh, can you can you start us off? Yeah, I mean, obviously, so so the obviously black lives matter is not a new thing but the recent um you know sort of upsurge in interest and and um protests uh happened after the semester ended so yeah. um there you know there's a, there's an interesting sort of gap in the summer where we don't usually inter uh, act with our students all that much right um but because this was special, and I sort of alluded to this earlier that we've been attempting to um teach early um, this 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 year, um, we are, for example, holding salons for our incoming MFA students before school starts, and one of those salons actually involved um, doing a reading um, around um, uh, black queer feminism in games and having a discussion, which was really vibrant and really exciting to see these students come in and be so. Um, thrilled with being able to talk about um, these ideas um, with the, their new professors. Um, uh, and that was, that was led by Professor Jeff Watson, and I was there too. And um, I think, you know, the success of that kind of a conversation, in addition to, by the way, of course, the university has, is holding many conversations on diversity and, and support and um, uh, discussions about making things better. I think all universities are doing that now. Um, but this was more personal. This was, um, this was about games um, and about representation uh, and about, um, uh, you know, critiquing and understanding representation in games. So, to me, those levels of more personal engagement are important. Obviously, the what I call the structural discussions are are important in the in the structural um, promises the, that are being made now are are important and, and um, you know putting in place methods for making sure that that this engagement continues are important. But I think that what what I see at least is that students appreciate having personal discussions. And that's what the, that's what these salons were. And that's, that, that's what really excited me. That's yeah, great. I would, I would, I would echo that. I know that um, like several of my grad students were in DC during the summer as protest actions were happening. Right. And um, several of them were attending and, um, you know, reaching out to me saying, you know, is it okay? I attend and you know like this kind of stuff and I'm like well you know just please do so in a socially distant and medically safe way and you know so we had some of those conversations but it was really about um, you know they were pinging me because I teach the meaningful games class in our curriculum and so they were pinging me saying you know are there games that 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 iterate on these topics are there games that 
some of these structural inequalities and how to, you know, how in the, you know, we saw all these actions within the games industry around, um, you know, aspects of this, right, about, you know, sort of institutionalized discrimination and, and the way that these things play out. And um, so that's led to a number of, you know, really good individual and group discussions within those groups. Um, but I think it's also going to wind up informing uh, a bunch of our curriculum come the fall uh, because that's, I mean, that's how it works in DC, right? Like stuff like this happens and then it's, you know, so what do we do about it? What does that mean for, you know, exploring, you know, policy options and, and uh, et cetera. And so, um, so I think that there's, there's stuff happening now in terms of the discussion around affects our industry and how games could hope to address things like this. But I think as we move forward, um, considering uh, you know, how we could use games as a tool in those discussions, I think is an interesting one. That's great. Kelly, do you have uh, any, any other thoughts? Oh, I'll, I'll just add uh, the class I teach in the fall is games, history, and society. And as a psychologist, I lean really heavy <laughs> on the society part. Um, and so unfortunately, no poor soul gets through my course without getting a heaping dose of like all of it. And they don't have to agree with things, but you know, there's an entire, and it, it feels weird to say an entire, you know, class dedicated to sexism, to misogyny, to racism, because obviously that could be its own degree. But I always let them know, like, okay, I want you to try and think of a character that's in a lead role that is, an, you know, not a white dude, and it's not a sports game. Go, and it's getting easier. But you know, having them do things like that is definitely really challenging. Things like, okay, I want you to think of a game that has, you know, somebody who has a mental illness that isn't portrayed in a horribly stereotyped way. Okay, now can you think of one that's a person of color who has a mental illness that is not in a stereotype? And no, <laughs> because they don't exist um, or are very, very more difficult to find. And so pointing those things out in those classes that are more culturally based. And I always tell my students, like, you may be wondering, why are you here? You're in a game design program. Why do you need to know about society? Um, and I always tell them it's because it's going to make them better game designers. They're aware of like where this stuff comes from and why these tropes exist and how long they've been there and what they're rooted in and what they mean, um, which, you know, I, I think is super important. And like, I have a very strict rule in my syllabus. I look through it. Mm, nope, too many white dudes. Let's find somebody else. <laughs> like, we, that's fine. I'll get this from someplace else. Let's find, you know, blood, sweat, and pixels. Let's find, um, you know, video games have always been queer. Let's talk about like these different intersections, not just today we talk about women. It's where these all things are intersecting as much as I, as, as I can, given my area of expertise, which again, you know, the social the inner dynamics, the psychological inner dynamics um, is where my expertise is. And if I don't have expertise, I bring somebody in to talk about it. And so I think just being really aware and doing that and being mindful of what we're teaching and being willing to reevaluate that given, you know, the class I taught last semester or last fall is class. The world is radically different um, than it was. And being open to have those conversations with my students is going to be a key part of, you know, why this class I think that that that's uh, a great set of answers okay. to that question. Um, I I see that we are basically out of time. Yes, birth of the chess queen. Um, so good. So um, <laughs> I just wanted to uh, thank thank all of the panelists on our roundtable and to say how much uh, I've appreciated the conversation and to thank all of you in the chat because I, it was some really great conversation happening there too. Um, I hope that we we all ha got a lot out of this or got as much out of it as I did. Um, so with that, just sort of like a round of, you know, applause for each other. And um, I hope everyone has a great rest of the Games for Change Festival. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks for, for uh, asking. Thanks so much. Bye. <laughs>